It's a, a real delight to welcome you all to this lecture by Wendy Doniger on Hinduism, Civilizations in Conflict and Contestation. Um, this evening is organized by uh, CREDOC, a UCL research center that was launched at the beginning of this year to explore the concept and the dynamics of civilization. Uh, I know that there are some of you here who have already attended some of the civilization events, and I hope that those of you who have are beginning to see some of the some threads that are emerging from the discussions that we've had. And we hope that you as researchers will be stimulated to, to pull those threads uh, together. For those of you who haven't attended a CREDOC event before, I would just like to set Professor Doniger's lecture in the context of this interest that has emerged in UCL in uh, the concept of civilization. Civilization, because it is a term much bandied about in the 21st century, and thus deserves renewed scrutiny. It appears in claims about clashes between religious traditions, and as we shall see this evening, also within a religious tradition. It appears in debates about the constitution of Europe, uh, which nations should be in and which should not, and also in arguments about uh, supranational identities, such as those of India and of China. Uh, civilization also, because the concept has the scale and the duration to permit big thinking about disciplines across the humanities, uh, to think about, uh, and the social sciences, uh, to think about language and literacy, uh, food and trade, race, religion, urbanism and the environment, progress and decline, inequality, and of course, the parallel idea of the uncivilized or the savage. These are all um, disciplinary areas that gain from being thought about on a large time frame and a large uh, scale as we're going to hear this evening. So CREDOC, the center, is organizing lectures and seminars. And in uh, 2016, we're uh, planning an international conference to stimulate debate and cross-disciplinary research activity. Um, colleagues are welcome to contact me or my co-director, Mike Rowlands, who is sitting here, with any suggestions for civilizational themes and events. And colleagues within UCL are very welcome to contact us with any inquiries about financial support for civilizational research that you might be undertaking. So we hope this lecture on Hinduism will provide one such springboard to future research on the concept of civilization. My co-director, Mike Rowlands, will now introduce uh, our speaker, Professor Doniger. Uh, we will then have a response from uh, Chris Pinney from the Department of Anthropology here at UCL. And afterwards, there will be a reception in Gordon House, which is on the opposite side of the road from the entrance to this building, slightly further down, uh, past the Bloomsbury <coughs> Theatre. There will be students here with our CREDOC uh, logo on their badges who would be very happy to uh, take you over if any of you are not familiar with uh, the layout of, uh, the very complex uh, layout of UCL. And I congratulate you all for making it into this lecture again, yeah. because that is very much part of the challenge. Um, so you're all very, uh, warmly uh, invited to the reception afterwards because it is of course also an opportunity to carry on discussion about these important issues. So now I pass over to my co-director, Mike Williams. Thank you. Maria, thank you very much uh, you know, for setting the scene for us. Um, I'm sure few in this room will need an introduction to the scholarly and humanistic achievements of Professor Wendy Doniger. Mercy Aliyar, Distinguished Service Professor of History of Religions at the University <coughs> of Chicago. She is one of the world's foremost Sanskrit scholars, preeminent in the sheer range and virtuosity of her skills in translation and interpretation of Hindu texts, which she combines with exuberance and pleasure, both in her writing and her passion for the wider dissemination of Hindu stories. 
She once jokingly said in an interview that she never wanted to be the sort of Sanskritist that ended up with only her and two others left in a room after a lecture. <laughs> I think you can see what she meant, with no disrespect to her or the scholarship of others, in the joy she expresses in using her philological skills to interpret hidden recesses in major Hindu texts, in telling their stories and uncovering the hidden voices, particularly those she has always said she favours, the voices of outsiders, of women, of animals and untouchables. As she once said, she likes to be able to tell the stories hidden in the text of people acting against the grain. In other words, she uses her knowledge to open up questions for us rather than closing them off, and does so through the pursuit and defense of classic philological skills combined with great imagination and vision. Only she, and one can think of maybe a few others such as Sheldon Pollock, but only she combines classically trained philological skills with a humanity and verve that is a joy to read and consume. And we want to celebrate that achievement tonight. We also have, however, an ulterior motive. As Maria has just explained, the UCL Center for Research in the Dynamics of Civilization is ambitious in asserting the need to resuscitate the concept of civilization as something more than a vague sign that describes behavior. For those who came to the last seminar on the emergence of the concept of civilization in European political thought, you will have seen how buried the concept of civilization became in European thought in two moves occurring over the last two centuries. One that articulated the separation of modernity and antiquity and consigned studies of civilization to ancient history and archaeology, whilst modernists <laughs> studied nationalism, and the other to evolutionary justifications of colonial and imperial rule. We will continue to excavate these Eurocentric layers in a future seminar, one organized next spring with a lecture by Ian Morris and a workshop organized by Anne Van Brees here in UCL. And all of you are very welcome to it. But the urgent need also is for comparison. And it's Wendy's uh, appreciation of comparison, in particular the tradition she has sustained in Chicago for the study of comparative religions that evokes questions of civilizational content. No more so than in the flair that we have already much appreciated in her thinking on the concept of civilization or civilizations. So if anyone thinks that antiquity is not in the present, then the fearlessness of Wendy Dominguez's views on how an understanding of ancient Hindu texts enables tolerance and the holding of radically different views within single civilization is a guide. Her capacity to mediate knowledge, involving herself in other disciplines, has meant she's brought insights from them to bear upon her philological skills with Hindu texts and opened up the world of Hinduism to a wider world of global appreciation and imagination. In other words, she shows how pluralism in one civilization and plural civilizations can abut and adjust with each other in the same context. She is for us one of those rare figures that makes the past come alive with vitality and to use one of our respondents, Chris Pinney's favorite word, with brio, <coughs> is her ability and verb in combining scholarship and techni technical skill with an openness of thought that we will have an opportunity to appreciate tonight. So it's with great pleasure that I invite Professor Doniger to present us her paper, Hinduism, Civilizations in Contest and Conflict. Whatever I say is going to be uh, a letdown after that, I must say. <laughs> but thank you very much. Uh, even half of it. And thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, as always, it's a work in progress, and I look forward to the Q&A. And I think we'll still have time. Is a bit of an echo? Is that better? Can you still hear me all? Okay. Throughout its long existence, Hinduism has held in creative suspension two movements so different as to merit the title of separate civilizations. One is the dominant strain of ritual, celebration of life, of family, of children, of sexuality, of food and poetry and sculpture, and the worship of many gods. 
And the other is the strain of philosophy, of renunciation, of the drive to become released from the cycle of rebirth, to denial of the senses, of family life, of children. These two paths live more or less peacefully, side by side, as available options for most Hindus, until more passionate and monotheistic strains of devotional Hinduism, or bhakti, developed after the 6th century CE. Later still, the philosophical strain inspired yet other forms of Hinduism, broader in their total scope, but containing with them a narrower, less tolerant streak as they came into contact with other civilizations. Islam from the 7th century CE, but more intensely from the 13th, then the British Raj from the 18th century, and then in the late 20th century, America and a broader global internet world. The cumulative effect of these encounters in present day India has been an unprecedented form of repression that threatens freedom of speech. Tonight I want to trace this historical development for you in the hope of shedding light on the present crisis. The early Upanishads around the 6th century BCE describe two paths. The life of those who sacrificed in the village versus those who meditated in the wilderness, or those who wanted to be reborn versus those who did not want to be reborn. There were animosities between the two subcultures. In particular, there was sometimes hostility against renouncers, although at the same time there was great respect for them. But by and large, they challenged and nourished one another through continual contact. It's useful here, I think, to make a distinction between two aspects of religion, orthodoxy, believing the right thing, and orthopraxy, doing the right thing. Though the categories are rather crude, and there were exceptions, in general, Hinduism during this early period was far more orthoprax than orthodox. Dharma, untranslatable word, it means duty, religion, religious merit, morality, social obligations, justice, righteousness, law. Dharma regulated the way people behaved, particularly towards the highest class from which priests were born, and toward members of other castes more than what they believed in, particularly with regard to the God. The good old Oxford English Dictionary defines blasphemy as A, profane speaking of God, or B, sacred things, or C, impious irreverence. The ancient Indians had no concept of blasphemy in the sense of A, profane speaking of God, which is primarily a monotheistic hang-up. With so many gods, one could not help preferring one to another, and therefore inevitably slighting some god or other. And it did not matter if you insulted gods who made no claim to omnipotence or omniscience, and certainly not to benevolence. Texts in this period, therefore, were able quite confidently to get away with what non-Hindus might regard as blasphemous attitudes to the Hindu gods. They told stories in which Shiva committed adultery and cheated at dice. Vishnu violated Dharma by killing a woman. Krishna made love to married women. Brahma lied, and so forth. But for most Hindus throughout history, blasphemy in the sense of C, impious irreverence to the Brahmins, was indeed a problem. The word adharma in Sanskrit, which means non-dharma or anti-dharma, we could call it undharma. Adharma, undharma, the opposite of dharma, is not type A blasphemy, which no one cared about. Undharma means B, C blasphemy, not behaving properly, offending the Brahmins, and you could get into big trouble. And so people were far more circumspect in what they said about Brahmins than about gods. For instance, the lawmaker Manu in the second century CE does not mention any punishment for verbal abuse of the gods, but he prescribes serious fines for the verbal abuse of Brahmins, depending upon the class of the offender, higher fines for lower classes. And he continues, quote, if a man of low birth hurls cruel words at a Brahmin, his tongue should be cut out. If he mentions his name or caste maliciously, a red-hot iron nail, ten fingers long, should be thrust into his mouth. If he is so proud as to instruct Brahmins about their duty, the king should have hot oil poured into his mouth and ears." 
The textbook of politics, the Arta Shastra of Kautilya, composed during the same approximate period. It's hard to date these texts because Manu borrowed from the Arta Shastra, and then the Arta Shastra was rewritten, borrowing from Manu, and then Manu borrowed from the new Arta Shastra. They're in conversation. So this textbook of politics is far more lenient than Manu in the prosecution for verbal abuse. It prescribes for all classes, unlike Manu who discriminates between them, fines but no physical punishment for quota. Insults relating to body, character, learning, occupation, and country for an insult relating to the body with words such as one-eyed and lame. And the fine is doubled if the insult is untrue a circumstance that Manu does not take into consideration at all. You still, if you say you're one-eyed to a guy who is one-eyed, there's a fine. It really has no problem. The artist Shastra also prescribes fines for, quote, disdain couched as praise of people who are one-eyed, lame, and the like, saying, what beautiful eyes you have, and for referring to people as lepers, insane, or impotent. But the artist Shastra occasionally does take class into account. It doubles these fines if the insult is directed at superiors and halves them if directed at inferiors or done through negligence, intoxication, or folly. And then it says, when someone of a lower caste insults someone higher, such as by saying vile Brahmin, a significant example, the fine is incrementally increased depending on the degree of difference between the classes. And when someone higher insults someone lower, it decreases depending upon the degree of difference. Yet it was safe to mock Brahmins in some ways. Sanskrit plays from this period almost always have a court jester, Dushika, who is a Brahmin and speaks Sanskrit, in contrast with lower castes and women who speak a dialect, but is a greedy, idiotic buffoon. The image of the fat and gluttonous Brahmin is also common in other texts of this period. But people would usually not dare to imply that Brahmins performed sacrifice only for the money or the food. It was the sacrifice and caste dharma that you had to watch out for. Texts in this period, therefore, had to tread lightly in their critique of dharma and what they said about the Brahmin occupation of performing religious rituals. Words are dangerous, or at least punishable. Under the circumstances, it is amazing that some texts said as much as they did. How did they do it? They managed a brilliant end run around Dharma using two techniques. First, the bookend technique, and then the straw man technique. Let me consider them one by one. Some texts use a technique somewhat like the trick that Hollywood producers adopted to get around the strict moral code, the motion picture production code enforced by the Hayes office from 1930 to 1968, and called the Hayes Code forbidding the depiction of a, sex, a successful crime in a film. In Ocean's Eleven, for instance, produced in 1960, Frank Sinatra and the Rat Pack execute a brilliant and entirely successful robbery of all the Las Vegas casinos, only to watch at the last minute all their money get burnt up in an incinerated coffin in an accident that has nothing to do with such tacked-on endings allowed Hollywood to violate the Hayes Office Code in the body of the movie. Similarly, the Arthur Shastra and other texts, including the Kama Sutra, the textbook of erotics composed slightly later, pretend to care about Dharma and pay lip service to it at the start and finish of the book, like bookends. But on almost every page of the text, they violate Dharma. The Arthur Shastra by advocating violence and trickery, the Kama Sutra by facilitating adultery. Their subversion of Dharma in this way managed to lodge in the body of normative texts an antinomian tradition, a pervasive undharmic agenda coated with a thin veneer of Dharma. Thus, like a driver with one foot on the brake and another on the accelerator, certain Indian texts ricochet between the praise of Dharma and the need to undermine Dharma. As for the straw man technique, it's the custom in the ancient Indian textbook tradition, the Shastra tradition, first to cite the opponent's opinion, known as the prior faction, the Purva Paksha, often without explicitly noting that it is, in the author's view, incorrect, and then to state the author's own correct opinion, setting up opponents as straw men and then demolishing them. 
But the text will also sometimes quote older scholars or opposing schools in order to say rather extreme things that they really believe themselves but do not want to own as their own, to get them on the table and then say, oh no, don't do that, in much the manner that a lawyer might reveal evidence to a jury and then, when reprimanded by the judge, say the jury will disregard those remarks. It's not always easy to tell these two agendas apart, setting up straw men to demolish and using stalking horses to say what you yourself do not to say outright since they both take the same form, which is ostensible disagreement. The prior faction technique that serves ancient texts as a very useful way of challenging dharma without seeming to challenge it. Their technique represent, represents what James Scott taught, has taught us to call a hidden transcript, a subversive transcript, one of the arts of resistance, a form of soft power, getting people to do what you want without a fight. The world these texts imagined largely disregarded rather than challenged the power of Brahmins. The texts were perfor perpetrated by Brahmins. No one else wrote Sanskrit texts, we'll return to this. But they were perpetrated under the noses of other more conventional, traditional, uptight Brahmins. This was not a class struggle. These texts therefore had a very limited direct effect on the actual lives of most people in ancient India but they are highly significant in their implications for freedom of speech for intellectuals, for their indirect effort, may, indirect effect may well have been widely diffused through the general population. And this is how. The knowledge of Sanskrit was limited to a very small, highly elite group, consisting primarily of men, and among them primarily Brahmins, with a sprinkling of nobles and wealthy merchants and they alone would have been able to read the text in the original. But the ideas in the texts were far more widely diffused. As the Kama Sutra, the textbook of erotic sciences, explains in justifying its assertion that women should become familiar with its contents. This is what the Kama Sutra says. Throughout the world, in all subjects, there are only a few people who know the text, but the practice is within the range of everyone. And a text, however far removed, is the ultimate source of the practice. Grammar is a science, people say. Yet the sacrificial priests, who are no grammarians, know how to gloss the words in the sacrificial prayers. Astronomy is a science, they say. But ordinary people perform the rituals on the days when the skies are auspicious. And people know how to ride horses and elephants without studying the texts about horses and elephants. The case of women learning the Kama Sutra is like those examples." End quote. So we may assume that the ideas, including the antinomian ideas, the anti-dharmic or undharmic ideas of these texts could have become known far beyond the narrow circle of Brahmin readers. An important instance of the prior faction technique can be seen in the case of people known as materialists, charvakas or lokayatas, who express seriously or sometimes hilariously undharmic ideas. The straw man citations of materialists in ancient Indian <coughs> texts, Buddhists as well as Hindus, so I'll only talk about Hindu texts tonight, these citations reveal numerous places where resistance to the dharmic party line was present. An early mockery of materialist views appears in the Ramayana, the great Sanskrit poem composed between oh, 200 BCE, 200 CE, a long period of time when a man named Jabali urges Prince Rama, the hero of the Ramayana, to ignore family obligations and live for pleasure alone, he offers this argument, quote, people here busy themselves with the right for the ancestors, but just look at the waste of food in the right that you feed the dead ancestors in this ritual of Shraddha. So Jabali goes on, but just look at the waste of food. What really is a dead man going to eat? And if something one person eats here to fill the belly of someone else, one could simply offer the sacrificial offering for a traveler, and he would need no provisions for the road. It was only as a charm to secure themselves donations that cunning men, i.e. Brahmins, compose these books that tell us, sacrifice, give alms, sanctify yourself, practice asceticism, renounce. Accept the idea once and for all that there exists no world to come. That's what Jabali says to Rama. 
Well, Chakali may merely be acting as the devil's advocate to stir Rama into righteous indignation, which is precisely what happens, or he may mean it. The argument that he offers, accusing the Brahmins of being in it just for the money, and mocking the idea of feeding ancestors who are not physically present and of a heaven to come, was to be repeated for centuries when anyone wanted to satirize materialists. To my present knowledge, and who knows, maybe one of you will know more, this passage in the Ramayana is the first instance of such an accusation and may be implicitly quoted in all the subsequent citations. Other texts usually add one more bit of blasphemy. If you believe that the sacrificial beast goes to heaven, why don't you sacrifice your own father and send him to heaven too? <laughs> and this is said over and over again in Sanskrit texts. The, the materialists say this, they say this, the same things. The Kama Sutra lists materialists along with fatalists and pragmatists. These are not philosophical schools, but types of persons people who care only about material wealth and having fun, as we might speak of a person as a Stoic or an Epicurean, not someone who follows the Roman philosophies, but just someone who enjoys a good bottle of wine. Materialists were said to engage in the ancient Indian brand of blasphemy, attacking the sacrifice of the Brahmins, but they were not accused of blasphemy in our terms. They didn't bother to attack the gods, which everyone was doing anyway and getting away with. Our knowledge of materialists, however, is only secondary and fragmentary, based entirely on criticism of their ideas by other schools. It is not, it is never, a living tradition. That is to say, we have no charvaka, we have no materialist texts. We just have other sorts of Hindus saying, you know what these terrible people say? They say this, the same thing. They say, Brahmins are in it for the money, they kill their father and mother. We have no examples of any materialist text. All we have is quotations from materialists in other texts which express strong disapproval of them. It is my belief that the materialists never existed as a school at all, but were invented by a Brahmin or a group of Brahmins as a way of smuggling blasphemous ideas into their texts under the pretext of disapproving them. Materialists continue to be mocked in this double way, ostensibly to condemn, secretly to propagate, despite major changes in attitudes to blasphemy in the period of bhakti, passionate devotion to individual gods, starting around the 6th century CE. Now some Hindu sects behave much more like monotheistic religions, positing a single deity, and unlike most other forms of Hinduism, actively seeking converts. The South Indian Shaiva, the worshippers of the god Shiva, even mocked their own proselytizing. This is one text. Quote, a Shaiva saint was a great proselytizer. He converted those of this world by any means whatever, love, money, brute force. One day the god Shiva came down in disguise to test him, but the devotee did not recognize Shiva and proceeded to convert him, forcing holy ash on the reluctant seeming god. When his zeal became too oppressive, Shiva tried to tell him who he was, but the baptism of Ash was still forced on him. Even Shiva had to become a Shaiva. <laughs> During this period and among these sects, there were occasionally violent conflicts, both with other Hindu sects and with other religions, particularly Jains, but also Buddhists. A character in a 9th century satirical play entitled A Bruhaha About Doctrines, the Dumbo Dumbo, complains that a cruel king has been rounding up certain undarmic <coughs> Shaiva mendicants, beating them up, and expelling them for violating Dharma. One of the guys in the group says, We drink booze, eat meat, have women, violating Dharma. And the king then threatens to kill them or throw them in prison. If this is a reflection of actual historical policy for which there is scattered evidence, it would mean that such groups were in fact actively prosecuted. Later, the Bhakti movement changed again in response to the monotheist philosophies of Islam. Well, the arrival of Islam in India stimulated the need to compete with a proselytizing monotheistic religion, which enhanced and complexified the situation a situation which enhanced and complexified already present elements of monotheism 
in Hinduism. Some of the bhakti sects as a result became orthodox as well as orthoprax, predisposing them to defend their doctrines as well as their practices against those who differed from them. At the same time, the more worldly strain of Hinduism lived on in bhakti groups too, as devotees, bhaktas, wrote erotic love poems to the gods, particularly, but not only Krishna, and other poems in which they threatened to worship other gods if the god in question didn't do what they asked. To this day, many Hindus spank the statues of gods who did not respond to their prayers. The situation changed again when the British colonized India. As not only Protestants, but Victorian Protestants, the British rejected as filthy paganism the sensuous strain of ritual, polytheistic Hinduism, all those kitschy images of gods with all those arms. It reminded them of Catholicism. <laughs> but they respected the more ascetic strain of philosophy, including Indian monism and idealism, so appealing to European philosophers from Schlegel to Hegel, and the Bhagavad Gita, so appealing to the American transcendentalists, and the monotheistic strains of bhakti, on the whole, a more reasonable sort of religion, as the British thought. The British also tended to prefer the company of Muslims to Hindus for a number of reasons, partly their horsemanship, including the simple fact that Islam was a monotheism that revered the Hebrew Bible and the Christian New Testament. Some Protestants within the British Raj tried to recast Hinduism as a monotheism with the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, thus also validating the worship of Krishna, the god of the Gita, as a monotheistic god. The Hindus were doubly inspired to position the Gita as their Bible, both in response to British pressure and in competition with the Muslims, whose monotheism, especially as preferred by the British, contribute greatly to the Hindus' desire to elevate the monotheistic Gita as the counterpart to the Muslims' Quran over polytheistic Hinduism. But as Pankaj Mishra has noted recently, the psychic wounds that V.S. Naipaul noticed among semi-westernized upper caste Hindus and that Hindu nationalists often blame on the Muslims actually date not from the period of Muslim rule in which Hinduism thrived under the new stimulus, but to the Indian elite's humiliating encounter with the geopolitical and cultural dominance, first of Europe and then of America. That's a quote from Mishra. Focusing on the single text of the Gita ignored the many other texts in which other gods, such as Shiva, were similarly represented as the one and only god. Moreover, the Gita had never had anything remotely approaching canonical status before this, though it had always been an important text. Other texts, Sanskrit texts like the Upanishads, vernacular texts such as the Hindi and Tamil versions of the Ramayana, and most of all, oral traditions were what most Hindus actually used in their worship. The many English-speaking Hindus who worked for and with the British came to accept the British evaluation of Hinduism and developed several new forms of so-called reformed Hinduism, such as the Brahmo Samaj and later the Arya Samaj, which valued the philosophical, ascetic aspect of Hinduism and devalued the worldly, householder aspect. Such Hindus were particularly embarrassed by the erotic mythology of the god Krishna, they went about trying to silence the love songs to the gods, to cover up the erotic sculptures, and to kick the temple dancers out of the temples. This sanitized strain of Hinduism, also sometimes called Sanatana Dharma, the eternal law, was just one form among many, and a minor strain as that, at that. It thrived primarily among the middle castes, who aspired to raise their social class by aping Victorians, this whole strategy aping the much older Hindu strategy of lower classes aping Brahmins in a process that the great sociologist M. Srinivas called Sanskritization. As Martha Nussbaum put it in a recent article, those at the very bottom who have little chance of improving their status and those at the very top who don't have to were and are far less touched by such foreign values and quote. Indeed, those at the top and the bottom went on, telling their stories and dancing their dances and worshipping their many gods. But the middle caste began to enforce the idea of orthodoxy and to embrace the concept of blasphemy against the gods. 
Now, for the first time, Hindus of one sort not only devalued, but denied other Hindus. Yet they could not sue them, for there, were no, for there was no law against blasphemy in India, not even in British India. British law in India upheld freedom of speech, so the authorities needed to employ other means of controlling possibly subversive voices. Laws against libel and sedition became the British Empire's censorship tools <coughs> in the subcontinent. Prime among these was Indian Penal Code 295A, which was passed in 1927 at a time of serious conflicts between Hindus, particularly Arya Samaj of Hindus, and Muslims. In 1927, a book entitled Promiscuous or Merry Prophet, written by an Arya Samaji, about the marriages and sex life of the Prophet Muhammad, based upon the hadiths, inspired legal action by a Muslim complainant. The publisher, Raj Lal, who did not divulge the name of the author, was arrested. Though he was acquitted in April 20, 1929, having argued that there was no law in India against insulting anyone's religion, he was murdered. When the Muslim community demanded a law against insults to religious feelings, the colonial British government enacted Section 295A. The law stated, quote, whoever with deliberate and malicious intention of outraging the religious feelings of any class of citizens of India, later on, by words either spoken or written or by signs or visible representations or otherwise, insults or attempts to insult, the religion or the religious beliefs of that class shall be punished with imprisonment of either description for a term which may extend to three years or with fine or with both." End quote. Other cases follow, most of them protesting insults against Islam and some defending Catholics, that is, defending religious minorities against Hindus. That's how the law was set. But the situation changed dramatically after independence in 1948, with the rise of a new form of Hindu nationalism, no longer directed against the British, but against other religions in India, primarily Islam and then Christianity. Hindus have long prided them on their tolerance, prided themselves on their tolerance, and indeed the worldly, polytheistic, orthocrat strain of Hindus has always been admirably tolerant of the belief if not necessarily the actions of other religions. That's what Michael referred to in the introduction. That's the Hinduism I've been writing about for half a century. But Hindus of the more orthodox strain remain intolerant of any slur cast against their intolerance. Shortly after partition, M.S. Golwalkar, a member of the nationalist and anti-Muslim Hindu association, the RSS, remarked that since Hindus are, as is well known, the most tolerant people in the world, they deserve to have the land of India to themselves, and therefore the less tolerant Muslims should be disenfranchised. <laughs> That's my paraphrase, but listen to what he actually wrote. Quote, the spirit of broad Catholicism, generosity, toleration, truth, sacrifice, and love for all life, which characterizes the average Hindu mind not wholly vitiated by Western influence, bears eloquent testimony to the greatness of Hindu culture. The non-Hindu peoples in Hindustan must not only give up their attitude of intolerance and ungratefulness toward this land, but must stay in the country wholly subordinated to the Hindu nation, claiming nothing, deserving no privileges, far less any preferential treatment, <coughs> not even citizens' rights." <coughs> phrase not wholly vitiated by Western influence implies that the British presence made Hindus less tolerant, which is indeed a valid insight, though the implication that this was the only cause of Hindu intolerance is confuted by the history that we have just considered. The rest of the paragraph, beginning with the strangely inappropriate overtones of Catholicism, is of course a paragon of self contradiction after independence, 295A began to be invoked by Hindus against other presumably less tolerant religions. Censorship of works dealing with the Hindu gods, and particularly with Rama, also began at this time. In this same period, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru himself once remarked that the ban against Aubrey Menon's book, this is another sentence introduced here, um, 
Chris Pinney is going to talk tomorrow in the two to five. Chris Bailey. Chris Bailey. Chris Bailey is going to talk in the period in Chris Pinney's seminar. This one must be confusing. From two to five tomorrow at, in the. I'll say something about it. He'll say something about it. So he, he wrote this wonderful article about Aubrey Men and the banning of his book in 1954. And so I've, I've taken one or two remarks from it. In, so on that occasion, on the banning of Aubrey Menon's book, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru said that the ban had to be introduced because the people, quote, were not ready for satires on religion. But as we've seen, Hindus have always satirized their own religion. Only now did some Hindus cease to be ready for satires on religion. In India today, the tension between the two old basic forms of Hinduism, the philosophical, renunciant, and eventually monotheistic strand, and the worldly, passionate, polytheistic strand, have again come into direct conflict, as some Hindus, the heirs and ghosts of the 19th century Hindus who had come to be so ashamed of aspects of their own religion, have not only denied the authenticity of the parts of their own religion, the worldly strand that they don't like, but have tried to erase it. This movement, which also took on a strong nationalist hue, began to call itself Hindutva, Hinduness, a term that was invented by the nationalist Vinayak Damodar Savarkar in his 1923 pamphlet entitled Hindutva, Who is a Hindu? Hindutva is both orthoprax and orthodox, and its adherents, whom I would I'll leave that out, has inspired violence against both Christians and Muslims. In 2010, Dina, Dina Nath Batra, a then 81-year-old school headmaster and member of the RSS movement, brought the first of a series of civil and criminal actions against me, Penguin Group USA, and Penguin Books India, arguing that my book, The Hindus and Alternative History, violated Article 295A of the Indian Penal Code. Penguin India drafted its lawyers to defend the suit, but after four years, on February 10, 2014, they abandoned the case, agreeing to cease publishing the book. A precedent on the part of the publisher, though it harks back to the Islam defending rather than Hinduism defending era of censorship, occurred on September 26, 1988, when the Penguin Group in the UK published Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses. An earlier instance of the bravery of Penguin UK was the defense of Lady Chatterley's lover in 1960. Penguin India, however, nervous about popular in, in 20, in the case of 2014, in 2014, Penguin India, however, nervous about possible repercussions decided not to publish a local edition. And indeed, this is the, this is, I, I've said this badly, this is the Rushdie case. So the Rushdie case in um, uh, 2010. Um, Penguin India, nervous about possible repercussions if they publish the Satanic Verses in India, decided not to publish a local edition. And indeed, within nine days of a London publication, India banned the Satanic Verses, becoming the first country to do so. Still banned, right? Yes. In my case, the heroes and villains among the penguins were reversed. This time it was Penguin India who bravely took on the book and defended it for four years, and Penguin International who, after a big takeover on July 1st, 2013, by Random House, which was in turn owned by Berkshire <coughs> and Pearson, forced Penguin Random House in India to drop the suit. There's more behind that we can talk about later, if you like. But this led to two widespread misunderstandings. First, the book was never banned, for it never reached the courts or the Indian government. There was just a lawsuit and then an out-of-court agreement between two private parties, the Batra people and the publishers. And second, Penguin also agreed to pulp all remaining copies. But as it turned out, not a single book was destroyed. Everyone rushed to the bookstores and bought up all external copies, <laughs> and there was nothing to ban, nothing to pulp. But the word banned and pulped continued to be used to fan the flames of media indignation. Just last week, on November 6th, the Indian Express ran an article about Batra entitled, Man Who Got Wendy Doniger Pulped Is Made Must Reading in Gujarat Schools. That's the title. The word pulping 
conjures up ugly images of Germany in the 1930s. And indeed, a Harvard-trained economist who was a Hindu recently demanded a public bonfire of canonical books by liberal and secular Indian historians and intellectuals who contradict the doctrines of the RSS. But this emphasis on the physicality of the books ignores the important and ambivalent effect of the internet in all of this as part of the problem, spreading lies to millions of people in just seconds, but also part of the solution, since banned and pulped books are easily available in India through PDFs. I myself send copies of the Hindus to anyone who asks for them, and I get a few my publishers don't like me to say this, because this is not a good way to get books to the public people. But nevertheless, in this case, I think it is justified. Turning to the contents rather than the form of books, the idea that you could be prosecuted for insulting a god, in contrast with the Brahmin, is, as we have seen, very un-Indian. But this is what Batra accused me of. The suit against my book begins, quote, <coughs> Suit for deletion of defamatory, derogatory, insulting, and objectionable passages referring to freedom fighters of Indian national movement and also to Hindu gods and goddesses from the book, namely the Hindus and Alternative History. The book is a shallow, distorted, false, and non-serious presentation of Hinduism which contains highly objectionable passages regarding father of the nation Mahatma Gandhi, youth icon Swami Vivekananda, hero of the first war of independence, Mangal Pandey, and freedom fighter Rani Lakshmi Bai of Jhansi. The book also defames youth icon Swami Vivekananda when it states that on being asked what he will eat, Swami Vivekananda replied, give me beef. <laughs> end quote, end quote. It's surely significant that the freedom fighters come first before the gods, a clear sign that nationalism drives this whole business far more than piety. This hypothesis is supported by Batra's other activities in the past and present, the must-reading referred to in the Pope headline. When the BJP came to power before, in 1999, the party in power now since May, they instituted a policy of censorship of all the textbooks in India, and the man they put in charge of that project was none other than Batra. School textbooks pose a, pose a special problem for freedom of speech, because unlike books that can compete in the market with other books that challenge their assertions, I've always said that I'm pleased to have Batra publish his books as long as he lets me publish my books. Textbooks present a child with a single interpretation, usually the first that the child has heard about the subject in question. Textbooks, therefore, have a far more serious effect upon the public understanding of that subject than other sorts of books have. Butler's revisions included the claim that the Taj Mahal, the Qutub Minar, and the Red Fort, three of India's outstanding examples of Islamic architecture, were designed and commissioned by Hindus. In the BJP school, students, students were told that child marriage, Jalhar, Sati, and various superstitions were all due to the fear of the Muslims. <coughs> the revisionist histories included, insisted that ancient Indians knew about airplanes. This is an article. One Rajasthan government history textbook claimed not only that ancient India had the nuclear bomb, it even practiced non-proliferation by carefully restricting the number of people who had access to it, presumably to Brahmins. <laughs> but the revisionists also demanded that several prominent historians should be arrested, including Roman and Tatar. More significant than what was added was what was taken out. Awkward facts like the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi by a Hindu nationalist in 1948 were simply left out of some textbooks. Even to mention, let alone to discuss or explore beef eating in ancient India, the destruction by Hindus of Buddhist stupas and giant temples was denounced as evidence of unpatriotism and of Christian Muslim designs. It was a deleted passage about the history and function of the caste system. I took it upon myself to put such passages back into the history of Hinduism, and that's where I ran headlong into Batra. He has sworn that he, quote, will continue to wage war against all those who write books like Doniger's, end quote. Although I did not know it at the time, it turns out that in 2006, long before the Hindus was published anywhere, Batra had kicked up a fuss when a committee recommended including a co in a course at the Indira Gandhi National Open University parts of my book, Asceticism and Eroticism in the Mythology of Shiva, 
which had been published by Oxford University Press in India in 1975. So he was after me long before the Hindus were. Narendra Modi endorsed Bhatra's books when he was Gujarat chief minister and has sent him to altering textbooks again now that he is prime minister. Indeed, right before the election of Modi on May 12, 2014, the New York Times ran an article entitled, In Indian Candidate Hindu Rights Sees a Reawakening. Reawakening. It quoted one RSS man who said, we will convert the whole world into the Aryan race. Where have we heard that before? When Pramod Kumar, an RSS propagandist, was asked what changes he hoped to see after the election, quote, Mr. Kumar reeled off a laundry list. He began by saying that Wendy Donovan's book, The Hero's Alternative History, recently withdrawn from publication in India, should not be out in the Western press, end quote. He called for an overhaul of government textbooks, which he said included insulting language about Hindu gods and excessive praise of the Muslim emperor Akbar. I was flattered to be linked with Akbar, <laughs> one of the first and greatest religious pluralists. But as for the RSS coming after the Western press for my book, I was reminded of Humphrey Bogart's retort as Rick in the film Casablanca to the Nazi officer who suggested that the Nazis might conquer New York. Well, said Bogart, there are certain sections of New York major that I wouldn't advise you to try to invade. <laughs> <laughs> National pride about science plays a bizarre role in these attacks, as science and religion blend to produce weird anachronisms. Back in 1985, a man from Varanasi insisted that the 19th century German Indologist Max Muller, who had edited and translated the Rig Veda, had stolen chunks of the Samaveda that, quote, facilitated German scientists' later development of the atom bomb, end quote. And as recently as October 28th of this year, Modi has publicly said that the statement that Karna, a warrior hero in the Mahabharata, the great ancient Sanskrit epic, that Karna, the statement that Karna was not born from his mother's womb means, quote, that genetic science was present at that time, end quote. And that the statement that the god Ganesha was given an elephant's head means, quote, there must have been some plastic surgeon at that time, end quote. <laughs> D.S. Naipaul, back in 1976, was appalled by what he called the prickly vanity of many Hindus who asserted that their holy scriptures already contained the discoveries and inventions of Western science, end quote. My favorite argument, this is not uh, a bhatra, but it's part of the general picture. Other Hindus have argued that the Vedic people discovered America long before Columbus, who was therefore actually right when he called the Native Americans Indians. <laughs> this is all about nationalism, creepily reminiscent of the Soviet Union's claim in the Cold War to have invented the telephone. It's not, or at least not primarily, about piety at all. But it is also about piety. The lawsuit against me objects that, quote, the cover page of the book shows pictures of Lord Krishna sitting on the buttocks of a naked woman and surrounded by other naked women, and hence depicts Lord Krishna in a vulgar, base, and perverse manner with the malicious intent to outrage the religious feelings of Hindus as a community, end quote. <laughs> the Arya Samajis in the 19th century objected to similar depictions of Krishna, but did not yet argue about, quote, malicious intent to outrage the religious feelings community, end quote. Perhaps this is progress, perhaps not. Here we go to Chris Bailey. Christopher Bailey has recently raised a number of interesting points arising out of the banning by the government of India in 1954 of the novel Rama Retold by Aubrey Menon, who was an Anglo-Indian writer of Irish and Indian heritage. Chris Pinney will tell you more about this. <laughs> <laughs> But let me just cite one or two, or two very perceptive remarks that Chris Bailey made in an earlier version of the talk. For these points apply to my case and to other cases in contemporary India, in all of which, as Bailey puts it, the issue was not really in any simple sense the conflict between individual and group rights. It was more about the definition of the inner and outer boundaries of John Stuart Mill's principle of harm. Mill had argued that simply offending my social rights could not justify an infringement of freedom. Real harm had to be done, but what was this real harm? 
And Bailey continues, the answer may lie in a nuanced judgment on whether the hurting question constitutes simply a lying insult against a group religion or caste which could lead to violent disorder, making it the equivalent of slander against an individual, or the American equivalent in Justice Holmes' definition of shouting fire in a crowded theater. Continue with Bailey. Or whether the hurt constituted a reasoned argument or artistic venture intended to uncover the meaning of or contradictions within a particular identity, person, or aggregate. The case of Menon and more recent events of a similar sort raise questions about the meaning of giving offense or hurting the feelings of various communities, end quote. The territory of 295A is a treacherous no man's land in which to maneuver. To prove that one had or did not have deliberate and malicious intention of outraging the religious feelings of anyone or that one did not insult or attempt to insult is a slippery matter. In my case, to show that in one of the instances singled out by Batra, Vivekananda did indeed advise people to eat beef, that I didn't get it wrong or fabricate it, knows his lying incident, <coughs> is no defense. To state an unpleasant truth can be hurtful and still is illegal. Perhaps to show that it is widely known that Vivekananda said that, and that therefore by mentioning it, I didn't make the situation any worse, nor did I intend to do so, might be a defense. Perhaps not. The final class of civilizations that contribute to the present crisis is the conflict between confessional and academic interpretations of Hinduism. A book actually entitled The New Class of Civilizations celebrates India's economic hegemony in the global world. My troubles with Hindus in India were in some ways the direct outgrowth of my troubles with Hindus outside the academy in America. In September 2002, a particularly persistent and annoying series of internet attacks on several non-Hindu American scholars of Hinduism was launched by a wealthy businessman in New Jersey named Rajiv Malhotra. His internet article entitled Wendy's Children grossly exaggerated my importance in the field it began. Wendy Downey was undoubtedly the most powerful person in academic Hinduism studies today. She chairs many academic and powerful bodies and is a prolific author. The most important leverage she has is that she's given more students their PhDs in Hinduism than any other person in the world and has successfully placed these former students in high leverage academic jobs throughout the Western world out of his mouth into God's ear to carry the torch of her theories and principles of researching Hinduism. There is no place one can go to in this academic discipline without running into the effect of her influence, end quote. And he went on to say that this is a bad thing. You can feel what Nietzsche would have called ressentiment dripping from every line of this bitter complaint. I put it on my CV in the section on honors and testimonials. <laughs> <laughs> and I often use it when people want a hyped up panegyric with which to introduce me at a public event. <laughs> Malhotra's influence spread to England, where in 2003, someone threw an egg at me in the Grenade Theater right around the corner at SOAS in the Q&A period that followed. And then a woman who questioned me directly quoted words that Malhotra, word for word, that Malhotra had used to question me at the meeting of the American Academy of Religion in 2000 in the United States. So two years later, three years later, two years, three years later, the same words were used in the quoting world. Without saying so. What is it that makes Batra and Malhotra, could we call them Bathotra or Malbatra, <laughs> so mad at me? For one thing, they want the world to see only the strain of Hinduism that the British endorsed, and I celebrate precisely the other strand of Hinduism, the one that they scorned and taught some Hindus to be ashamed of. But another factor is surely the fact that a non-Hindu is teaching and writing about Hinduism and is presumed to drown out Hindu voices. Chris Pini's devastating but subtle critique of Malhotra, epistemopatrimony, speaking and owning the Indian diaspora, a wonderful notes that Malhotra's organization, the Infinity Foundation, kind of hubristic, emphasizes, quote, the protocols that authorize some and, in their view, disenfranchise other voices, end quote, especially peer review. P. 
Pitty describes Mahotra as an ethnopreneur, opposed to what he regards as a cart to what uh, Mahotra regards, as a cartel of people committed to the global dominance of the Western knowledge factory, a cartel of which I am apparently a charter member. Another objection is to anyone writing about Hinduism from an academic rather than a confessional point of view. Hindus of the Malhotra, Malbatra ilk demand that <coughs> academic voices, even from Hindus who happen to be academics, or academics who happen to be Hindus, in fact, in the case especially there's been persecution of such Hindu academics, that such voices should not be heard. And that is where the chauvinism slips in. Indian academia does not include religious studies. To learn about Islam, one goes to a Muslim madrasa. To learn about Hinduism, to a Sanskrit talk. It's therefore not surprising that the Hindu Twa people do not understand, let alone share, the goals of the academic study of religion. Naipaul declared India a wounded civilization because of what Pankaj Mishra calls a craze for foreign consumer goods and approval from the West, as well as a self-important paranoia about the foreign hand. And Mishra continues, Today, a new generation of Indian nationalists lurches between victimhood and chauvinism, and with ominous implications. They feel frustrated in their demand for higher status from white Westerners, end quote. Modi is therefore, quote, stoking old Hindu rage and shame over what he calls more than a thousand years of slavery under Muslim and British rule, end quote. Mishra suggests that the people whom Salman Rushdie calls Modi toadies once had Western tales, T-A-I-L. <clears throat> and Malhofa still clings to that tale, glorifying our priceless heritage, as Modi praised him for doing, by spewing forth a steady stream of popular screeds, asserting that American and European churches, Ivy League academics, think tanks, NGOs, and so forth, are trying to break up Mother India with the help of both Dalits and sepoy intellectuals, that is, Indians who betray their heritage by indulging in Western disciplines such as religious studies. <coughs> but Malbatra cannot speak for all Hindus. And the study of Hinduism remains a gloriously rich myth of the two ancient and still vibrant strains of this great civilization, or rather this cluster of sometimes clashing civilizations. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Doniger for her um, magnificent lecture, wise, witty, and offering a generous guide to what may be an increasingly difficult future. The lectures displayed Professor Doniger's great virtues, her exceptional grasp of the long durée, a fidelity to the obligations of any sincere historiography and the discipline of classical philology, together with a feisty resilience honed by many Chicago winters and intolerably <laughs> humid summers. We need also to celebrate her resilience as a necessary civic virtue. Listening to her remarkably unbittered, unembittered account of the banning of the Hindus on alternative history and the pressures to which she and many of her students have been subjected, I was reminded of a chilling account written by Ava Lips, the wife of the Cologne-based anthropologist and Africanist Julius Lips. In her book, Savage Symphony, published in 1938, Ava describes in horrifying detail how her radical, free-thinking husband, the center of Cologne's intellectual life, was gradually edged out by local Nazis, vest pocket Hitlers, as she calls them. This is a reference, I think, to the new compact vest pocket cameras, which were then being marketed. The lips are deposed by junior faculty. Their field notes and research materials are seized by the Gestapo. They flee to Paris and subsequently to the US, where Julius Lips would found the anthropology department in Howard University. 
I draw your attention to this perhaps odd example because the overwhelming lesson of Ava Lips's extraordinary account is that the event she describes, a tiny fragment of the far greater colossal tragedy, were not inevitable. Her narrative is gripping precisely because you sense that if a few people, sometimes a single individual, had stood up and said no, history would have been different. Again and again, she describes events and encounters whose outcome is uncertain. It is only retrospectively, because those few individuals did not act, that we are able now to perceive a history that was somehow inevitable. In this context, it's perhaps worth noting that the BJP wave in the 2014 general election involved them garnering 31% of all votes cast nationally. Sometimes a tsunami looked at from a different angle can seem more like an eddy. We have also had irrefutable evidence tonight that Professor Doniger herself has not been pulped. She is still here, and so is her book. Sounds like you should email her for a PDF. <laughs> Timothy Garton Ash recently observed that India was what he called the, quote, canary in the cage in relation to the global canonization on distribution of the freedom of speech as an enlightenment virtue. Sorry, um, in relation to the global distribution of the freedom of speech. As an anthropologist, the canonization of the freedom of speech as an enlightenment virtue is unavoidably problematic. And as a citizen, I find myself always asking a set of opposing questions about surveillance, for instance, by the NSA and GCHQ, illegal wars and drone strikes in which the states of freedom seem more short-term, more immediate. So for me, Professor Doniger's capacious wisdom opens up the questions of other civilizational traditions and doxa. When we read that the new head of the Indian Council of Historical Research, RSS member Yela Pragadam Sudarshan Rao, a previously little known and barely published figure, sees as one of his main objectives the integration into academic history of the epic narratives of the Ramayana and Mahabharata, since they are, as he said in a recent interview, quote, true accounts of the period in which they were written, we need also to remember that in this country we have also allowed the mythicization of history in the name of the Enlightenment through such documents as the sexed-up case for the war in Iraq, or is properly called the Iraq dossier, but is more commonly known as the dodgy dossier. This was our country's equivalent of the claim that the Taj Mahal had been designed and commissioned by Hindus. The Iraq dossier may seem like an ancient history, something as distant as the Upanishads. It was 12 years ago, in fact. But it turns out that it remains very close to the heart of the institution we're currently in. For one, Lord Reed is currently the chair of UCL's Institute for Resilience and Security Studies. So we're talking about a very different kind of resilience here whose advisory board also includes the head of ultra-electronics, specialising in maritime and land battlefield capability, according to their website, and the head of Cassidian UK, the defence wing of Airbus. Lord Reid, then John Reid, you may recall, was appointed by Tony Blair as leader of the Commons following Robin Cook's principal resignation, resignation with the task of ensuring a majority vote from the illegal war against Iraq. So my suggestion is that we take Professor Doniger's wonderful lecture as I assume she intends it to be taken, not as a contribution to an escalating clash of civilization narrative which pits a valorized freedom of speech against those villains who would seek to deny it, but a forensic analysis of the intertwined doubleness or multiplicity of all cultural traditions in which as citizens we are all asked to and must make decisions about what we believe and how we want to live, and one which involves us having to confront truths very close to home, as well as those geographically and seemingly culturally distant. These multiplicities, the cluster of clashing civilizations, are structured around class, subaltern and superaltern, gender, the public and the state, and so on, both in India and here in the contemporary UK. Professor Doniger is a Sanskritist and a comparativist, an intellectual with a very broad vision 
And I understand her to be raising questions not only about India, her primary focus of study, but about changing visions of history, about the manner in which history and notions of civilization are politically mobilized by contemporary regimes, and the manner in which intellectuals and the academy need to develop tactics which will allow the alternative and controversial histories, the, as she puts it, impious irreverence, the other strands in which she is so invested to prosper. Before I end, uh, please permit me a brief commercial break. Tomorrow, as uh, Wendy has already indicated, between 2 to 5 p.m. in the anthropology department, we'll be hosting a symposium in honor of Professor Doniger. Its focus concerns the way in which different scales of history are framed and the political ramifications of these frames. There will be papers on Gandhi, a controversy about how to narrate the Ramayana uh, by Chris Bailey, to which Professor Doniger has already alluded, contemporary political narratives in Indonesia, two great papers about Sri Lanka, and one on the temporal frames and claims of mindfulness. Papers will be presented by Faisal Devji, Chris Bailey, Kevin Fogg, Dave Rampton, Neera Vikram Singh, and Joe Cook. It is, in other words, a stellar lineup, and you are all, you are all invited to join them and Professor Doniger in discussing her provocations through this linked event facilitated by Credoc. So finally, please uh, join me in thanking <coughs> once again Professor Doniger for her wonderfully thought-provoking and brilliantly delivered contribution. Thank you very much. Chris, thank you very much for a wonderful response. Uh, we have a few minutes, uh, you know, about 10 minutes maybe, for uh, a question and answer. Uh, would you like to start? Yeah. Uh, two things. The first thing I want to, you know, when, when you talk about this this pull of the ascetic, you know, uh, again, mm -hmm. you know, with the householder, mm -hmm. but isn't there a sort of compromise that the ashrama system mm -hmm. brings to this two aspects, mm -hmm. where you are a grihasti mm -hmm. in the second stage, mm -hmm. and then by your fourth stage, mm -hmm. you give in to this impulse of moving away. Mm -hmm. So I think at some point, uh, Yes. Hindu thought does try to address this problem and come to some sort of a compromise. Uh, uh, did you hear the question? It's a good question. The, the, the idea of four stages of life. There are a number of ways. It's like yes. the, the, uh, the idea that there are four stages is one of them. And the understanding is after you're a householder, you're uh, a renouncer. But a lot of people didn't want to become a householder. So it didn't really work. No. It, there was still, when people said, instead of marrying on, you become a sannyasi, his mother was angry and everything like that. So um, it was an attempt. And there were other attempts, some more successful than others. One way was to say, the householder, if he does his job well, is really getting the same merit he would have gotten if he was a renouncer. There are all sorts of ways. And as I said, for most of Indian history, they were friendly ways. It was only under these peculiar circumstances of the really violent bhakti movies, yes. mainly in Tamil Nadu, and later on the response to Islam, that we're really monotheists, that people said, you're absolutely wrong. We're the ones who have it right. For most of the times they say, well, I'm a householder, you're a sannyasi, that's fine. There are a number of ways that those two traditions work together until these breaks in, in these civilizations, these confrontations, where they said, no, we can't have both systems. One is right, the other is wrong. But also during the Bhakti movement, mm -hmm. I think especially around the 15th and 16th century, you also have that the, the Grihastha is the one ashrama where the four Purusharthas can be achieved. That's right. As compared to in an asset, as an ascetic, mm -hmm. you are not... Bhakti was world. very worldly. Yeah. I mean, so the worldly Bhakti was very worldly. Yeah. Yeah, the Bhagavad Gita, you can go from the Gita into that where you really, everybody should be a householder, and you, there, are, there are lines in the Gita, verses in the Gita would say, no, 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 never become a household. So the Gita itself fed a lot of these different traditions and other things as well. We're still in a period where some people said one thing and some people said another thing and no blood was shed. No. And no people said, you can't say what you say. I, I worship Ganesha, you worship somebody else, that's fine. There are these moments, like the moment of the Shiva in that rather funny text, where they say, you must not worship Krishna. That's where you get a break in uh, a moment, a type of Hinduism which is not tolerant. And yet there are still lots of Hindus that find you worship Vishnu, I worship Shiva. So you have these 
Sinuism is so broad that you have intolerant strains from time to time, and you have always people saying, we can do it different ways, they're all possible. The Kama Sutta, which is one of my favorite texts for a number of reasons, says um, you should really do them one at a time. But because you never know how long you're going to live, do whatever you can whenever you can. <laughs> this always seemed to me a more reasonable uh, approach to it. That was one way of putting the astronauts together. And my second, my, sorry, just one. Your fourth uh, question. <laughs> 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 well, go ahead, go ahead. Last, no, 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 my last one. <laughs> it's, it's, it's to do with when you said that the Chaga, the Lokaya system, there is no uh, set text. Mm -hmm. But the Sarva Darshana Sangraha by Madhava mentions it as chapter one. Absolutely, so and, and so does the Adamba Dumba rule. The Sarvadarshana says, these Chavakas say terrible things, but the Sarvadarshana Sangra is not a Chavaka text. It's one of the many texts, one of the best actually, and one of the many texts would say, there are these people, they say these terrible things, they're wrong. And then the Shankara, Dikpajaya, he goes, he says, oh, the Chavaka, there are lots of texts, that's one of the best ones, but there are no Chavaka texts. There's no text that says, you know, it's like this. There are skeptical texts, and people mistake them sometimes. There are texts that say, really, you can't know anything, and ultimately that means you can't know whether there are gods or heaven. But they never say, and therefore kill your father, and therefore don't do this father. They just say, ultimately, you know, there is no certain knowledge. And I think in the history of Indian philosophy, people have said there are Travaga texts because they identify the skeptic texts, but they're entirely different. This, hill, this really humorous, extreme mockery of the Romans and so forth is not skeptical, it's, it's something else. Materialist is the wrong word. I'm not sure, I, I can't really get the right word, but they're always called materialists. Mm -hmm. It frames um, talk, uh, the talk as the civilization contested conflict. Mm -hmm. That was the thread that you worked mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. and you ended your, your talk by saying, it's a great civilization. Mm -hmm. Still. Still. What, what's great about it? Well, what's great about it <laughs> <laughs> is that with the, with the exception of these bozos who happen to be power at Delhi at the moment, um, it's full of people who have an astonishing variety of ideas of what uh, the world is and what the gods are and what one should do. Um, and um, it, it's full of, of marvelous poets and artists and narrators and villagers and um, with these important and dangerous exceptions, they live side by side as indeed Hindus and Muslims live side by side throughout India in most places without the kind of trouble that these guys in Delhi are stirring up. So its greatness is in the prevalent and majority strain of um, wonderfully creative and imaginative and tolerant ideas. But it, there has always been, and there is now in power, another strain which uh, goes against this and says, no, no, Hinduism is only this and it does not. So the greatness is that the majority is still um, doing um, what I consider the most interesting things in religious and, and artistic thought that there is. It's still good or what? You go to a village and you go to your storytellers in Rajasthan and uh, it's, it's, it's still there and throughout history it certainly has been there. So that's its business. That's why sometimes in this last year I thought, why didn't I just stick with Greek? My original language. But but I, that's just in two o'clock in the morning moments. Basically <laughs> I'm really glad that I have always had it. Thank you. Uh, I was fascinated by your talk, particularly, you know, the way in practice they try to sabotage or undermine whilst ostensibly being lip service to the concept of dharma. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a the worst in history. And actually, my daughter presented your book to me recently as a present. So, but I have to admit, if I'm being honest, that I was disappointed. In the last 20 minutes of your talk, you devoted to this hostility to your publication of your book and the particular individuals like Manhotra and Dhiranath Bhatra. They're very powerful people. I know, they have become powerful. 
Nevertheless, as you said at the very last sentence of your talk, that they do not represent all of India. They don't even represent all of Hindus, let alone all of India. Sure. And I would have, and I know you study Hinduism, but you not study Indian society. Nevertheless, given that you spent 20 minutes of your talk or thereabouts mm -hmm. on that, mm -hmm. could have said a couple of points, which if I could very briefly mention. One is that given the circumstances in which the partition took place and the Holocaust that took place, and how it benighted the relation between India and Pakistan, it imposes a very considerable strain on Indian society, and still it has tried to maintain freedom of expression and movement mm -hmm. and run as broadly secular society. Mm -hmm. That's the one issue. Mm -hmm. And since in that context, one needs to see how Hinduism developed or rise. There have been some militant version of Hinduism like RSS and Hinduism. But there are countervailing narratives about the development of India since independence. And if you had just put that in the context, mm -hmm. it would have been, you know, in perspective, seen the hostility yeah. towards you and your book, which I deplore actually that hostility. But nevertheless, it has to be seen in that broader perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I tried to do that in a way by showing what, what the concerns are. Um, there are other things I could have said, which is there are other books. There are lots of other books that are also in trouble. There was the famous incident of Ramanathan's essay in online. I mean, this is the, this is I, I, I think you know this is just what I know best about. Um, but it is a broader it is a broader problem, and I and I certainly agree that. <coughs> since that it's amazing in a way, it's good that um, Hindu-Muslim uh, relations have been as good as they have been after that enormous tragedy and so forth. And in a way, it's precisely because of that that I'm so sorry that this new party is stirring it up again. It was doing pretty well. It was doing really very well. There were always incidents of violence and so forth. But by and large, I thought that considering how terrible things were in 1947 and 48. Um, India was, the incidents of violence against Christian missionaries came from time to time, but not that much and so forth. I think India was really doing quite well. And I worry about the present government losing ground there. So that's why I spent so much time on that. I think these are uh, dangerous people. Um, and <coughs> American, I uh, regret the fact that an American like Ma uh, Malhotra is so close with Modi that it's really making things difficult for those of us who teach religious studies in America now. It's not helping things in India either, that Malhotra Mal Mal is putting his considerable funds into the RSS in India as well. So I see this as, as, as a bad thing. Wendy, one of the things that's really interested me is why they've gone after an academic book so viciously, mm -hmm. rather than a sort of more popular book or a film. And I'm not just thinking of the older films like you know, the religious films, which, I mean, people like N.T. Rama Rao became mm -hmm. chief minister, attacked the caste system and the Mahabharat and mm -hmm. in them quite openly. But say just two years ago, this film, Oh My God, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard of, mm -hmm. you know, where, where um, based on an American, an Australian play where a man's shop burns down and he <coughs> tries to claim insurance, he's told it's an act of God, so he says he'll take God to court, and the, the God men come in to take his case. And you know, he's chased for blasphemy, but Krishna himself incarnates himself in Bombay as a motorcycle rider and so on, and, con and converts him subtly. Well, this film was only banned in the UAE, never in India. And why these films, which seem so much bigger and more powerful in you know, terms so many of more people? Yeah. I mean, not in terms of quality, of course, but I'm talking yeah. about spread. Yeah. Why do you think they decide to go after an actor? Well, um, that's interesting. I didn't realize that the films were getting out. I saw a film which I thought must be terribly offensive about five years ago in which there's, there's an American who sets him up as a guru and he really isn't a guru and people mistake him for one. And there's a scene in which his dog pees on a shivalink. And I thought, wow. I was actually offended by that myself. I thought, oh, that's not real out in a movie. Um, 
so I so the question really is why is film getting away with it, um, or why is why are books still is it is it old fashioned is it that people still really believe that the power of the written word is that the blasphemy laws were invented primarily for books but we had the Hayes office business in America for, for years, which, which also prevented, I mentioned crime because I was showing Ocean's, I mean, mentioning Ocean's Eleven, but also adultery and also blasphemy and so forth could be shown. Um, I don't know why film is getting away with it. I can see why books are getting it, because books always get it, and uh, people are gone frightened of books. Um, but I don't know why film is getting away with it. I think hooray. Um, Maybe that's maybe that's the way out. Maybe we should just keep making films and stop writing books. So, so, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that film is getting, and I can't answer the question, but I'm glad. Of it. I'm just, wa just wondering if it's because film is seen as less less of a left wing bastion, a, and b, if it is just this this concern about people who are not Indian speaking for yeah. for him, especially the, the female people who are not. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't really talked much anywhere about the sexism involved because I don't want that to become the issue. The issue is not sexism, the issue is freedom of speech. But uh, the, the, the sexist tone of all of these things is, is unmistakable. I think it's much worse than I'm a woman. Certainly it's worse than I'm an American. That's part of it. But as I say, Ramanujan got it and Jim Lane got it and uh, it, it's a wider phenomenon. Um, it could be that people don't think of films as part of, of the world of worship, that people don't get their religion from films. They get fun from films. And they do, in fact, they read books, they read the Bhagavad Gita, and they read this, and then they're reading my book, and so forth. That, that, that a book puts it on, on it, uh, itself on a par with scripture. It is, after all, a script. And that a film is not scripture. Um, the Catholic Church came down really hard on the last temptation of Christ, so obviously some religions believe that films are dangerous. Um, Scorsese got into terrible trouble for that. Um, so that's a counterexample. I don't know what the treatment is in um, Islam of films that are insulting to the Prophet. I don't know. That's just a subject I don't know anything about. Um, Really yeah. <laughs> so you've been trying, yes. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Professor Donica, for your talk, which was very interesting. Uh, well, in recent times, or even not so recent times, India is often lamented or criticized as being too soft a state. Mm -hmm. Do you think the fact that the majority of its population follows Hinduism, which is credited for its tolerance, is in any way responsible for that? What's the last word you said is what is in any way responsible for that? Um, yes, I think that uh, my answer to why I call it a great religion, I think that by and large, well, let's go back to orthodox and orthoprax. Um, I think in terms of intellectual content, words and ideas, uh, Hinduism is indeed the most tolerant religion I know. Given the function of the caste system, I cannot say that it is the most tolerant in terms of social practice. I think it's rather intolerant. I would, it's not a contest. I wouldn't rank all the religions of the world. But certainly, you cannot say that Hindus are as tolerant of people's behavior as they are of people's ideas. So that, that distinction has to be made. So when you speak of Hindu tolerance, and people say, yeah, what about the caste system? You're, you're talking about two different things. To the extent that the caste system is a religious phenomenon and not simply a social phenomenon, and I believe that that is the case, that remains um, something that Hinduism, I think, should not be proud of. But in terms of intellectual openness, I do think the fact that the majority is Hindu and that Hinduism is, in terms of doxis, by and large, extremely open-minded, um, it is to the credit of India as a whole. Um, that is not to say that Islam is not also intellectually tolerant, but I think that your question about the, the, the overwhelming present government and present population is, is a true one, that they, there are more Hindus than they are tolerant. Um, the Christians in India are a special case because Christianity is in India to proselytize. So the sorts of Christians who come to India are not 
tolerant Christians. That the whole the whole assumption of proselytizing is that my religion is better than yours and you better change to mine. That's not to say that Christianity as a whole is an intolerant religion. The branch of Christianity that comes to India has stirred up a lot of bad feeling among Hindus, and I think it's not the best sort of Christianity that there is. So that's a special case in a way. Um, and Islam uh, has also largely not been a proselytizing religion in India. The, 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 the statements, the, the percentages are really very low. That's been a falsification of history that they came and said everyone had most of, them, most of them thought that Indians weren't good enough to become Muslims, so they didn't bother to proselytize them. So, so that's not a problem, the same with the Christianity as a, as a minority and as a foreign presence is a doctrinal problem. So, yes? Um, kind of linking on to what was just raised, do you think there's something innate in the nature of Hinduism which um, allows it so easily to become a tool by which to disseminate you know, um, notions of power and stuff? Because is it something in the history, in fact, just the very fact that it kind of arose as a synthesis of many different beliefs? Um, because it kind of reaches this pinnacle in 2014 today when you get this in insane contradiction when BJP come into power primarily through the corporate elite and the kind of mass Hindu working class being their primary vote banks, right? And any kind of, you know, whatever school of thought you come from, any economist would be able to tell you, Marxist or not, that the benevolence towards the corporate elite and the neoliberal policy pursued by the Modi government and championed by them is gonna inherently challenge and exploit the same working class that were, you know, um, uh, you know, forced into voting for them. So is there something, and, and you see this throughout history, you just, you know, you mentioned in your talk about past instances when uh, the middle classes were appealed, or middle castes were appeased and these things. So is there something about Hinduism which uh, lets this arise? I wish, I wish that Hinduism was the only religion which, when it got political power, behaved very badly. <laughs> um, here I'll put on my hat as a comparatist and, and say that, um, have you ever noticed the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages? Have you ever seen what it happens? Um, I always, as a Jew, I always thought that the Jews were different, right? That, that um, we were really nice and never bothered anybody, and then you see what's happening in Israel. So I fear that religions seek political power, all religions do, and when they get it, they misuse it. And uh, that Hinduism is no different from any other religion. It's, it, when you have a theocracy, when you have religion in power rather than just an elected government or even a monarch who doesn't really care about one thing or another, in which history we did have the War of the Roses, you do see what happens when religion does get into, into politics. So I don't think it is, that it is unique in Hinduism. <coughs> that once you have a religious group rather than simply a political group in power, you get the kind of abuses that you're having in India today, and it's it's not unique, alas. It's well, I suppose, what I suppose kind of uh, makes the answer slightly more complex is the the, the, the post-partition constitution of India <coughs> forcefully stating India as this secular socialist uh, state, right? And it's almost America is supposed to be a secular state too, and you exactly. cannot elect a president who doesn't say he believes in God. No <coughs> way. So religion gets in even in secular states. And of course the word secular, um, the whole history of the word secular in India is so interesting. Because secular in American English and in the original use of British English meant the, the complete separation of political power and religious power. A secular government is a government that has nothing to do with religion. <coughs> we have an amendment in our constitution for that. Secular in India means protecting minority groups against majority groups, and that means pro-Muslim now. Secular is a dirty word in some circle. So secular as a word has undergone such a difference of meaning, and it. it's just like a history of religions all in itself. It's just what happened to the word. So the United States no longer has a secular government. Israel certainly does not have a secular government. Um, and India no longer has a secular government in any sense of the word. It has a government that has a strong affiliation to one particular religion and its values and its creeds. 
if America, the Supreme Court, is about, I think, to outlaw abortion entirely, it's more and more states, and overturning its rules on gay marriage in more and more states, which are probably done at the Supreme Court, because of religious pressure throughout America to do that. So yes, it's a secular state, but, but religious groups in America are changing major laws about abortion and gay marriage. And it's not a secular country in any, in any state. And it's not exactly a theocracy, but it sure is not a secular country. So I say it's, it's happening all over. I, I, I'm not an expert on Islam, but I read the newspapers. So I, I would say Islam is also part of this problem. I would just, I would say no more than that. Just one last just question, then we should go for a drink. But it, isn't that, that's not about piety. It's not about piety. It's not about piety. Right. It's about power. Exactly. So it is a secular, <coughs> still is secular in this sense, mm -hmm. because it's not about belief in, in God. It's just it's not the about use of, of, of belief. <coughs> it's not about the historical God. element. No. And uh, um, I mean, religion is not always do about we believe that God. the, the presidents Prime ministers are religious? Yeah. I don't think so. So um, in that sense, we do think, we do know actually, we have sacred England and is better. That, but one thing, religion, someone once said it's a good thing that the Church of England is, is so important, <coughs> otherwise people might be religious. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend Richard Gomberts, when he, when he volunteered for the army, and they said, when you're in, he said, I have no religion, they put down C of E. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I, I think England is, is, is in better shape than America at this point in that respect, for sure. Um, and I do agree that um, when we're speaking of religious power, we're not speaking of piety, on the contrary. Um, we're, we're speaking of we're speaking power. On that wise point, should we all go and have a drink? <laughs> 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 <laughs>